heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Caroline Hyde off this week. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, we'll bring you the latest headlines on the Trump indictment and break down the broader social media implications. We'll speak also to the head of Accenture's technology group for their outlook on generative AI as industry heavyweights call for a pause in developing the disruptive technology. Plus, Huawei posting its first profit drop in a decade as US sanctions force the China tech giant to invest in R&D. We discuss with Huawei Chief Security Officer Andy Purdy. Let's bring you these markets. When it comes to the technology sector, we're in the last day of what's been a constructive quarter. You look at the Nasdaq 100, we're up by a percentage point, ending this quarter higher. Best quarter back since the second quarter of 2020, second best quarter of the decade. Similar performance in the semiconductors. You look at the SOX, the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, okay, four tenths of a percent higher, but actually, again, the best quarter for that index going back to June of 2020. Yields kind of pulling back a little bit, 3.5% on the 10-year risk on, generally speaking, and Bitcoin is certainly a part of that story. The main headlines are around former President Trump and his indictment, how that's playing out in the tech sector and in the equity markets. These are special purpose acquisition companies or SPACs. Digital World up 6.5%. This is the SPAC that's due to take true social public. The idea here that the market's talking about is that the indictment of former President Trump puts a spotlight on more conservative social media platforms. Those more conservative social media platforms, including Rumble, for example, a video platform, are seeing money flow into them in the equity markets this Friday. Let's get the specifics of what's happening from Laura Davison out in Washington, D.C. Laura, where do we stand with the indictment of former President Trump? Well, he could be arraigned as soon as Tuesday of next week. Um, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, people have been waiting for ever since Trump said recently that he could be arrested. Uh, but this really, uh, this announcement yesterday really took everyone by surprise, uh, including Trump's own lawyers who weren't really uh, expecting this to come and, and, and certainly not expecting an arraignment next week. Uh, but, you know, this is going to look very similar to any other type of arraignment that would happen in New York. Trump is going to have to get fingerprinted, have his mug, mugshot taken, have to sit in the basement uh, of the courthouse right. um, in Manhattan. Laura, have we heard from former President Trump on any of these platforms? Yes, he's been on True Social, um, really, uh, you know, going, uh, you know, uh, full force as he is known for, you know, his really bombastic language. Um, in some cases, you know, um, some have suge suggested that he's almost seemingly trying to start a riot, saying that we protest in the streets. There's increased security in Manhattan. This could really uh, potentially be a problem for Trump. You know, it would not be unprecedented for judges to say that he can't go to social media platforms uh, to try to in incite violence or anything else. Bloomberg's Laura Davison out of D.C. Thank you. Let's stick with the conversation and more on Trump's influence throughout social media accounts. Jennifer Greigel, Syracuse University Assistant Professor of Communications. We started this program talking about investors buying in to stocks related to more conservative social media platforms. What's your interpretation of that reaction? Well... If we can look to history for a second, uh, Trump wouldn't be the, the first ex-president to, to face a trial. We had Roosevelt actually here in, in Syracuse and uh, back in the day, early 1900s, and it drew an intense media spectacle. OK, so I don't know if people are focusing on these you know, uh, fringe uh, platforms. I think they're missing the point that uh, people aren't just going to be talking about this and following this on social media. There will be legitimate media interests. They'll want to read the news. So this could bring a spectacle like you would see with uh, O.J. Simpson and things like that, right? So I think Trump knows how to manipulate the media, too. And it, all eyes will be on that trial if, if, if it reaches that point. Jennifer, to point out what is a first, right, a first former president to be indicted. But I, I, I hear your point on the news cycle. Twitter wants to be the place where the news cycle plays out. Do you think that's where it, this, it used this... to be? It used to be the place more where the news cycle you know, played out. But, you know, I, I, I still think that that the platform has fundamentally changed since Musk took it over. Uh, you still don't have the same type of user base there that you used to see a lot of academics and journalists. Sure, so, some people are out there still, but not like you used to. So 
people may follow uh, more of the details, uh, you know, almost like a reality TV show there. But I don't think the same types of influential uh, you know, media folks are, are on Twitter like they used to be. How strong a landscape do conservative voices have in social media right now? How strong are those conservative specific platforms? I think we need to look at it more collectively um, as those who are in power. I know there's a lot of attention on, you know, what is Trump trying to cause a riot, but he's also an ex-president. Uh, I think we need to focus a lot more on the sitting president, on those in Congress. And again, that, that crosses political parties, right? And and looking at uh, the influence that they're exerting now, it's not just like... Uh, is their voice being amplified more on this platform or that? But look at what's happening with TikTok, okay? And the ability to to influence and potentially uh, shutter that app here in the United States. That is monumental. And we are really not talking about that em- enough. So that's that's influence. And it, it cuts across, you know, conservative to, you know, right, left. Um, it's a collaborative effort, as I see it right now, between the White House and Congress. So I'd be focused more on that if I was uh, looking at investments. Jennifer, have the risks to social media and use of social media changed since Trump left office? Yeah, I, I think, again, nothing has really changed uh, when it comes to how Presidents are using social. Um, if anything, you know, maybe they're exerting more influence on um, regulation and, and the ability to maybe shutter apps, as I mentioned before. But like, we have to keep in mind that censorship will look different here in the United States, and also just the increasing use of government social media. I, I just think that we need to to really address that uh, as a country, not just here in the United States, but around the world. Um, so for me. As a public, we really want these platforms and our media environment to, to function and be safe, regardless of who's in power. <laughs> and uh, and and I, I really don't think that uh, that risk has gone away under Biden or potentially future presidents, regardless of their party. So maybe some people are comfortable with, you know, kind of Democrats steering uh, some of the policy around social media right now. But we have to remember that they may not always be in power. So you really want your social media platforms, your media uh, environment to be a healthy one that is uh, just good for the public, good for discourse, good for democracy. And uh, I still I still see that, that right. right here today. Profenif- Professor Jennifer Geigel of Syracuse, thank you for your time. Now, sticking with social media, TikTok isn't the only social media company under ByteDance that's gone viral. U.S. downloads of Lemonade are surging. It's a content sharing platform similar to TikTok, but focusing on longer form lifestyle videos. Think of it as a mix of Instagram and Pinterest. But information about the app is murky. However, regulatory filings and various media reports suggest it is owned by ByteDance and Lemonade's ties with the Chinese company may expose it to similar scrutiny faced by the TikTok in the United States. Coming up, how generative AI could usher in a bold new future for business merging physical and digital worlds. That's according to Accenture's new Technology Vision 2023 report. Accenture Technology Group Chief Paul Doughty joins us next. Right now, final day of the month, final day of the quarter. The story here is technology having a constructive three months in 2023 so far. The Nasdaq 100, best quarterback since the second quarter of June 2020, outperformance in semiconductors, a lot of momentum tied to the narrative around rates. This is Bloomberg. I think there are different ways of viewing what uh, what we're asking for. Um, I think the idea that you know the the CEOs of Microsoft and and Google and DeepMind are going to read this and say, "Oh, sorry, yeah, you're right. We we completely messed up, uh, and we'll definitely stop right now." I, I don't think that's going to happen, um, but I hope that it at least begins a, a serious conversation about what would be necessary to develop systems that we can have confidence in. Um, and there's 
two parts to that, right? Could we develop ways of testing the systems that we already have so that we can show that they do not present risk, that they will not uh, help people to commit suicide and so on, or we change the way we design the system so that we can do that. And I actually think the, the latter is probably more likely. I would also say that um, legislators, uh, the European Union, for example, are close to passing the AI Act, uh, which would require these kinds of steps uh, as a matter of law, uh, so that you could not put systems on the market uh, unless you could satisfy the regulators that they were safe. That was Stuart Russell, Berkeley computer science professor and AI expert. And he was one of the signatories of the petition calling for a halt to AI development. And that's where I want to go, more about generative AI and the kinds of opportunities that it opens up in the world of technology. Paul Doherty, Accenture's technology group chief executive, author of two books on the impact of AI and machine learning, particularly on jobs and work, Human Machine, and his most recent one, Radically Human, How New Technology is transforming business and shaping our future. Paul, welcome to the program. You heard there what Professor Russell had to say. The findings of your report about the outlook for AI contrast with what the industry is calling for right now. Yeah, I know uh, Stuart well. It was great to hear his comments. Uh, we do some work together, and I have a deep respect for, uh, for Stuart and his views. And, you know, look, I think uh, the open letter on, uh, on AI was, uh, was, I think, called important attention to a real issue, which is, you know, getting serious dialogue around uh, the implications of AI and really responsible AI. You know, I would say that if, if, a, if an organization or a company is implementing AI and you don't have a responsible AI policy and approach, it's simply irresponsible. So I think this call to attention around how the impact the technology is having, uh, guarding against bias, uh, ensuring accuracy, looking at intellectual property and all these issues are really important. But I don't think a pause is the, is the, is the step we need. I think what we need is more transparency and dialogue and more companies to take steps you know, that we've been working on for four or five years, which is actually having training, policies, compliance programs, and the like in our company and in companies that we work with to make sure organizations are taking the right steps with artificial intelligence. You're, you're plugged into hundreds, if not thousands, of tech companies globally. Is a six-month pause feasible? Can anyone actually make that happen? No, I don't, I don't think it's the right, you know, the, the pause is the right way to think about this. There's tremendous innovation and progress happening. And I think, uh, you know, we there's... Uh, I think there's approaches, uh, many approaches in place to look at how we use the technology in the appropriate way. So I think the, the right thing to do is to keep is to keep the experimentation, keep the innovation going, but increase the dialogue around you know the guardrails that we need to have in place on some of the topics that I mentioned earlier. So that's the approach we advocate. We're working uh, you know with many organizations uh, around the world, including some of the ones you mentioned, on putting the right guardrails in place as we move forward. But we think the innovation and experimentation actually helps contribute to that dialogue. The conclusion of your report and your survey is that AI is going to spark a pretty large wave of, of innovation, right? Next generation technologies. How, though? How does that manifest itself? You know, AI really unleashes uh, a kind of a next level of capability for organizations. That's the way to think about it. And uh, we had a, a launch of our annual vision report yesterday. And on the uh, on the, the launch, we heard from everything from a 125 year old company to a 25 year old you know AI startup founder about the implications that it has on business. And 98 percent of executives in the research that we've done uh, talk about the, the the fact that they're going to invest in and believe generative AI in particular will have a big impact on their organization. And the impact that it'll have is allowing organizations to do new things they couldn't do before. It's new uh, new levels of creative capability powered by uh, the foundation models that you hear about. It's new ways for work to be done, new ways to empower people, and it essentially, it is, in essence, give workers superpowers to do new things and uh, more, you know, expanded things with co-pilot type of capability powered by generative AI. And I think it really creates a great opportunity for individuals to use technology in a different way, right. and for businesses to look at how they, you know, how they make these uh, big advances and how they compete, differentiate, and grow. Paul, let's get someone else's view on where we are in the AI cycle. This is what the Stability AI CEO had to say in the last 24 hours. This is bigger than 5G 
or self-driving cars. We've had others on the show that say what's happening in artificial intelligence is akin from the shift to mobile, for example. You are a technologist. Do you agree with any of those statements? Yeah, uh, what I've said is, uh, is that I believe what we're seeing now with foundation models and large language models is one of the three biggest innovations I've seen in my you know, multi-decade career working in technology. The first was uh, when I used uh, one of the first browsers and saw the, the potential and power of the internet. The second was uh, when I saw the, the first iPhone come out and realize the power of bringing that kind of access and technology to billions of people around the world. And then when I dove in uh, with uh, foundation models and large language models and the transformer technology and saw the creative power that it had and the power to allow humans, you know, workers, you know, people to interact with technology at a whole new level, yes. I think it is yeah. that type of breakthrough. Paul, Accenture, your own company, is laying off 19,000 staff across technology, mass layoffs. What is your assessment of the reasons why layoffs are happening? Well, you know, um, we announced, uh, you know, really record growth in our business. We had record sales in the, the results that we just announced. You know, 35, you know, as a, you know, one point, 35 deals of over $100 million or more around technology driven by a lot of what's happening with uh, companies needing to reinvent faster by applying technology. Uh, it's, so we, we see and we see continued robust and strong demand for technology. What we announced was really uh, something we do every year in terms of looking at uh, how we're positioned with, with talent for the growth that we have going forward. And uh, the only difference this time is we made, we took a proactive step to get fit for what we see coming. But this is you know kind of in the realm of what we do every year. And we think you know the, the market going forward, especially with some of these new advances in technology, companies needing this technology to, to operate more resiliently in the complicated world that they operate in is going to continue to drive that demand. All right, Paul Doherty, Accenture's Technology Group Chief Executive, thank you. Now coming up, Uber going more and more green, how it's intensifying its efforts to electrify the vehicles on its network. NASDAQ 100, we've said it, best quarter going back to the second quarter of 2020, actually the second best quarter of the decade for this tech heavy index. Interesting story on Bloomberg about how insiders though are some of the sellers of technology shares. Certainly worth checking out. This is Bloomberg. Time for Talking Tech. Alibaba and JD.com have begun preparations for a trio of the year's biggest Chinese debuts. Alibaba's logistics firm, Kanyao, has kicked off discussions with banks for what may become the first of several IPOs by units of the e-commerce giant. And on Thursday, two JD subsidiaries filed for first-time share sales in Hong Kong. Those three listings could raise about $5 billion between them, according to sources. And Bloomberg reporting that Tesla is looking to build a battery plant in the U.S., which would likely be a controversial arrangement with China's dominant electric vehicle battery maker. Tesla discussed plans involving the company CATL with White House officials over the past few days. Sources told myself and colleagues Gabby Coppola and Jen Jacobs that this has been going on for a couple of months now. Now, speaking of EVs, Uber also has some news as Earth Month fast approaches. Today, BP Pulse and Uber announced a new global mobility initiative. The idea... Get the drivers in to the stations to charge their vehicles. Joining us on the program now, Adam Gromis, Uber's global head of sustainability policy. Interesting play. Everyone wants to drive electric. Everyone wants to ride electric. Is this for the drivers or ultimately is this for the riders? Yes. Good morning. Uh, first, Uber wants to lead the rideshare industry to an all-electric zero-emission future. How are we going to do that? We made a pledge to reach... 100% of rides in EVs and micromobility by 2030 in the US, Canada, and Europe, and everywhere we operate globally by 2040. How do we do that? Working with drivers, helping them make the switch, working with consumers, make it easy, push a button, get a clean ride, and finally, transparency, because we need accountability and we know that we don't just earn it. This play is all about helping drivers, meeting drivers where they're at. When we talk to drivers, they say their top two concerns are the EV cost, in EV charging. That's why this deal is so important. We're making deals like this with energy companies around the world. 
This deal with BP Pulse helps make it so that we can reach more drivers where they are. And many drivers today are at the pump. So on that point, a lot of drivers watch this program. So we asked them, what's holding you back from electrifying? These are the results. You can see them on the screen over there. Cost of EVs, 50% of respondents. Lack of charging, 43%. In San Francisco, it's pretty easy to get an electrified ride. Other cities, it's not. Do actually drivers need a bit more financial help than just offering the infrastructure? This corroborates with what we hear from drivers as well, these, these top barriers. For us, it's finding ways to leverage our marketplace, to leverage our scale, to find new ways to bring tools for drivers, supply for drivers through partnerships, and new innovations to make it easier to find the charging. For instance, uh, just this week, we expanded Comfort Electric. Comfort Electric is a push a button, get an EV, and not just an right. EV. You can get a premium EV, a Tesla, a Pulsar, a Ford Mach E. These are vehicles well, people want as EVs, but they're also cars that people want to be in. Let's think about innovation. this holistically. What percentage of the total rideshare fleet in the U.S. or globally is currently electric? Last year, we quadrupled the number of active drivers who are using EVs on Uber in the U.S., Canada, and Europe to 40,000. We're operating the largest all-electric ride hail fleet outside of China. It's very exciting. Uh, in the U.S., we're seeing drivers switch to EVs five to eight times faster than the general population if you compare it to, say, EV registrations. Uh, and what we're seeing is that drivers on Uber, in some markets like California, in some markets like London, are right. going even faster, 10 percent, 15 percent of miles served. So let's throw this forward. I don't think any money changed hands between Uber and BP on this transaction. Money. What is your dollar commitment to driving this initiative? Uber's made a commitment to make $800 million in total resources available to drivers to help make the switch. We talked about it at the beginning, right? Drivers face a financial hurdle to get into EVs. So we made a commitment to $800 million to make it available to drivers by 2025 to help hundreds of thousands make the switch. In the U.S., that takes the form of a dollar per trip incentive from Uber. This agreement with BP creates a global framework where we can create local bespoke offerings right. that meet drivers where they're at and tailor to the local market conditions. All right, Adam Gromis, Uber Global Head of Sustainability Policy here in San Francisco. Thank you. Now, coming up, Huawei's CSO Andy Purdy joins us to talk about the company's earnings, its business outlook, despite those smartphone chip sanctions and much more. These are some of the biggest names that have driven the S&P 500 so far this year. A lot of emphasis on the mega caps, but my goodness, NVIDIA, 90% gain year today. A lot of that around the hype with artificial intelligence. A lot of analysts seeing NVIDIA as the main beneficiary. But also look at Meta, Tesla and Warner Bros doing pretty good. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Huawei posted its first annual profit decline in more than a decade. After years of U.S. sanctions have all but obliterated the smartphone arm of the business and compelled the Chinese telecom gear maker to ratchet up research spending. Here to talk about the outlook for Huawei is Chief Security Officer Andy Purdy. Andy, this is the direct result of U.S. sanctions on your financials. That's right. It's, it's great to be back on your show and uh, I'm enjoying the new, uh, new time slot. Uh, yeah, this has uh, been a major impact of the last couple of years, particularly decimating our consumer business, uh, causing a drop of $30 billion in a year. Uh, but we have worked through this. Our business is stabilized and our operations are steady and we're, we're leveraging our partnerships, 5G to business, and our research and development hit historic numbers. And we see a path forward and that we are heartened and determined to uh, move forward with a tremendous emphasis on innovation and partnership. Andy, what is your hope for the net result of spending on R&D to get out of the impacts of sanctions? Well, what we're seeing is working closely with partners, uh, finding new kinds of technological capabilities that can be enabled by 5G and other technologies so that when you look at ports and mining and healthcare and uh, manufacturing, it's clear that these R&D investments are going to help uh, strengthen operations, create greater funding, uh, greater efficiency, and it's going to drive increases in gross domestic product in those countries that do it and those businesses that do it. So uh, we're also doing some hardcore research uh, on some of the major problems in science, such as Shannon's limit, the amount of error-free data that can pass through a channel, because we have to start getting ready 
for 5.5G and the amount of uplink and downlink capabilities that's going to be necessary. It's going to be a gigantic problem that the hard truth of science may may limit the, the benefits of unless we can overcome some of those hurdles. What's happening in mainland China is, is Huawei's push into uh, 5G for companies that are in China. How is that going? And, and can you replicate what you're doing in that field outside of China and other jurisdictions? Well, I just got back from the Mobile World Congress, one of the largest conferences in the world in Barcelona in late February, early March. So I had an opportunity to talk to a lot of customers, a lot of partners, representatives, a number, number of governments around the world talking about and sharing lessons learned about what are the use cases for these technologies? Where can carriers, where can enterprise benefits the, benefit the most from these new technologies to increase efficiency, reduce the carbon footprint, and bring new capabilities for monetization to carriers and to customers? And it's an exciting story. And, and, and frankly, as an American, I'm heartened that the investments we're seeing in the United States look to going to be increasing the amount of real 5G between now and 2025. So the AT&Ts and Verizons and T-Mobiles of the world are investing heavily. So hopefully America is going to uh, learn some lessons and kind of drive forward with some important progress in these areas as well. Because it's, it's not just about making money, although it's important. It's about supporting small and medium enterprises and bringing a, a greater quality of life to our citizens and our companies. There is changes afoot within Huawei. Meng Wanzhou takes the rotating chair position starting next week, I believe. How does that impact management structure, how Huawei is run? What's her grip on this technology company right now? Well, it's an interesting situation, and it's, it's highlighted again, but I've been with Huawei 10 and a half years, and this concept of having a rotating chairman coming in every six months, the structure of the company, the organization of the company is not dependent on the particular individual that's the rotating chairman. We have these structures, we have these processes, we have these compliance systems. All those things are in place. So the particular uh, tone, the particular priorities of the rotating chair can have an influence, but the company is organized in a way that this creates continuity yes. and stability. Andy, there's a lot of focus right now on Huawei's activities within the chip space, semiconductors, a lot, especially on the software and design side. How is that going? Is it actually a material path to circumventing what the U.S. is trying to do in terms of chip controls? Well, frankly, we're kind of at a position of new normal. We're not looking back on, on those things that we can't do. Uh, we know that certain aspects of the uncertainty looking forward uh, we can't control. And, and frankly, as an American, I'm heartened by the fact that the U.S. is, is investing in, in chip manufacturing. When I look at the efforts around the world to make up for the sanctions, you know, I'm a little concerned about the potential impact on American jobs or the American semiconductor industry if they're not allowed to sell and continue to not be allowed to sell uh, non-sensitive chips to Huawei and other companies. Uh, but Huawei is going to be fine. I'm, I'm kind of concerned about the, the future for the United States and some of the things we aren't doing to improve our competitiveness. We saw China respond, retaliate overnight, launching a cybersecurity review of Micron. It's a specific case, but what's your interpretation of, of China's action there? Well, from my perspective, with a somewhat of a cybersecurity and privacy background, Given the nature of the cybersecurity threats in the last couple of years, it's been demonstrated, and there's not enough emphasis, that in the solar winds and Microsoft Exchange server attacks, that so-called trusted suppliers are violated. So regarding cybersecurity and privacy, it's not about what company it is. It's not about what country it is. We have to have measures in place that are, that are objective, providing assurance. There needs to be transparency, and there needs to be accountability for companies and governments and individuals to do the right thing from a cybersecurity perspective and to protect our data privacy, because we're not doing nearly enough to protect data privacy in the United States. Huawei's USA Chief Security Officer Andy Purdy, we're always grateful for your time and for answering the tough questions. Thank you. Let's stick with the world of chips, with Japan saying it will expand restrictions on exports of 23 types of leading edge chip making technology. Tokyo's move follows months of lobbying by the US to get Japan to come on board in tightening shipments of semiconductor tools to China. Japan and the Netherlands had agreed in principle to join the US, but have sought to chart a middle road between the two superpowers. Coming up, we're going to talk about the state of fundraising in Silicon Valley following SVB's collapse with the CEO of Portage, Adam Faleski. 
And again, recap, last day of the quarter, last day of March. This is where we stand year to date. A very different picture in the banking sector. Contrast that with technology. This is the impact of SVB's collapse among regional banks and other financials year to date. The complete opposite of what we see, frankly, in the technology sector. This is Bloomberg. Digitalization and decarbonization is eating up an ever larger share of, of GMP. And if you want to invest in growth, that's where you want to be. The dollar value going into climate related venture plateauing between 2021 and 2022, driven entirely by the decrease in the growth rounds. In the Europe, it's largely uh, sort of isolated to the UK, where, where SVB was important. Um, but uh, I think it's interesting to see that there's been an explosion in venture debt, uh, particularly last year. Though I do expect to see a change in underwriting uh, policies around what profile of companies can get debt and on what terms relative to what we were seeing in the past. For us, we're looking at how can we support our startups so that they don't have to continuously get into that kind of hedonistic Silicon Valley treadmill of raising more and more corporate equity. I think founders have uh, woken up to the reality that taking on more money at higher terms doesn't necessarily play to their benefit in the long run. Just some of the venture capital guests throughout the week on the program. Let's get a wrap of all things VC and deals. Bring in Bloomberg's Katie Ruth. You forget, it seems a lifetime ago, it was this week that First Citizens stepped in and took some of SBB. This is what some of the venture community wanted. Yes. So they found a home for um, Silicon Valley Bank. It's in North Carolina, so pretty far from Silicon yeah, Valley. Right. But um, at least, you know, Silicon Valley Bank will live on. Um, I've, I've talked to some VCs who are cautiously optimistic about this. Uh, they don't know what the strategy will be for Silicon Valley Bank under First Citizens. They're hoping that, you know, it will be more of the same. They right. liked Silicon Valley Bank before. Um, it, you know, the bank had good venture debt terms, and they're hoping that will continue. The other big story is Alibaba spinning off units. In Abu Dhabi, there are IPOs. A tech IPO is back. I don't know if they're back, but it's good to see a little bit of activity here. I mean, right. obviously, last year was super quiet on the IPO front, but Alibaba is, you know, s splitting into six different businesses so that they can focus on their core yes. business and bring value to shareholders as separate units. And so the logistics unit, which handles uh, delivery, could go public before the end of the year in Hong Kong. I don't know that we're about to see a flurry of IPOs in the near term in Whether the U.S., yeah. but... Um, certainly, you know, we are seeing some spinoffs. The big tech IPO of last year was right. Intel spinning off Mobileye. Katie, stay with us. Joining us now for a bit more on the ventured side, Adam Fileski, Portage CEO, Portage Capital Solutions, delivering flexible equity capital and strategic resources to help public and private later stage fintech and financial services business. Adam, it's been a hell of a week, uh, to be <laughs> honest with you. But just give me your broad strokes reaction to the saving of SVB in part? Well, let me start with saying that the market was really tight even before this event. Um, you know, th there was really two factors at play. One was, you know, the broader private markets were, were starting to see challenges given uh, the, the setback in public markets and the privates catching up to, to the valuation compressions that were happening, happening there. And therefore, private companies were really avoiding coming to market. And that was compounded by the fact that GPs themselves were starting to get concerned about raising capital and their next funds and were slowing down their pacing. So the market uh, was becoming very tight and actually relatively quiet. And yeah. many of these companies were using their, their venture debt facilities to extend their runways so that they could avoid potentially coming into a market where scarcity um, w was high. And this is just obviously I I exacerbated um, you know, those factors. And now we've got a situation where you know, a lot of companies are going to be in a tighter window. We call it the fundraising gauntlet of the fall. 
because they have less l potentially less flexibility than they well adam they did. adam it's good that you uh it's good that you're with us because you can run that gauntlet i can't i'm not a venture capitalist we're, we're we're talking a lot about last day of the quarter nasdaq 100's going nuts semiconductor index going nuts when you're trying to benchmark your private company portfolio companies against what you're seeing in public markets why are those two competing ideas right now well one the the public uh, markets and multiples fell a lot faster and harder than the private markets. The private markets are are really just catching up. I think you know at the later stage we're starting to see a flattening between the the, the premium the the private uh, premium as you go further down the maturity curve into earlier stage. Um, you know the public and the private markets always have a little bit of a different equilibrium. Um, but but I, I would say at the later stage, we're, we're starting to see a little bit more balance between the two. Adam, I want to ask you a little bit about structured equity. I know your firm has some experience with that. Are you finding right now that a lot of these unicorns or, you know, some of the, the largely highly valued companies would rather save face and take new money at difficult terms rather than doing a down round? Look, it's not just a question for the management team. It's it's a question for all stakeholders. The you know the management team is just one component. Their their investor base is, is another. Uh, obviously, it's a debate that these stakeholders have to have. I think it's a structured equity solution like that that we have on the offer does offer flexibility on valuation versus. Uh, potentially a, a preferred security with some seniority and governance right. And everyone just has to weigh um, what are the different levers that that construct the best outcome for both the company itself and the investor. And I think a structured equity solution just has more flexibility. Uh, if all you can do as an investor is offer a preferred security or a common security, then you're going to be much more... Uh, sensitive to the valuation. So are you guys busy right now? Are you finding that a lot of companies are about to raise more money? It's unbelievably busy. Um, you know, in the last four months, we, we've we entered into over 200 NDAs at this point. Um, you know, our selection, uh, we just closed our first deal. So one deal uh, versus 200 companies that we've we've dug into is a small conversion rate. We, we expect that type of ratio to continue. Uh, so it is a, it's a really interesting opportunity and great time to deploy capital. Um, and and I think, you know, some people may think it's adversarial between stakeholders and us as capital and, and seeking a solution. It, it's quite different. I, th I think everyone understands the market. Um, you know, if if the, the, the company performs, we're all aligned and the downside protections we seek won't be necessary, and right. it's a win-win for everyone. So, um, you know, it's it's a very positive and, and quite frankly, right now, uh, an energizing market because we're having so many inter interesting conversations with great companies. Right. Hey, Adam, it sounds then that you at least are not staring into this kind of post-SVB abyss, deploying capital where? Artificial intelligence, fintech, where are the opportunities? So we're a vertically focused fund, always have been for the last seven years. So everything we do is fintech, mostly banking, insurance, and wealth management. Uh, there's opportunities in all of those verticals. I would say uh, in right. insurance, it's been beaten down the most, has some balance sheet intensity. We're seeing some great opportunities. Plays that are more balance sheet intensive or consumer facing. There's a lot of people that uh, are concerned uh, about the resili resiliency of the consumer and access to capital, you know, we've yes. got a lot of experience in both and and we can price that risk. And uh, as you say, if, if you've got capital and you can underwrite the risk, it's an amazing time to be in the market. Adam Faleski of Portage, Bloomberg's Katie Roof, both with me. Thank you for your time. Another story that we're following is Netflix restructuring its film group to make fewer movies each year but also centralized decision making. It combines units that produce small and mid sized pictures, a change that will result in a handful of layoffs and the departure of its two most experienced executives. The streaming service has released more original movies than any other company in Hollywood recently, producing upwards of 50 projects a year.
Now, coming up, we'll have more on Apple's Hollywood ambitions and the resurgence of the granddaddy of role-playing games. You know what it is? This is Bloomberg. So in today's Going Viral, we're diving into the world of Hollywood and why your favorite video games are now turning into motion pictures. Take Tetris, for example, the addictive puzzle game from the 1980s, I wasn't around then, is part of Apple's foray in a tinsel town. It takes viewers behind the scenes in the battle over distribution rights to the game, part business biopic, part Cold War spy thriller. The nearly two hour film is almost certainly the best ever made about international copyright negotiations. The smartphone maker ramping up to spend over one billion a year on films for theatres and streaming, keeping most of its focus on movies that appeal to adult audiences. Speaking of games, by the way, Dungeons & Dragons, new owner Hasbro, has big ambitions for the fantasy role-playing game. Bloomberg's Felix Gillette has the scoop on the game that's staging a comeback. On the eve of its 50th birthday, Dungeons & Dragons has never been more popular. The granddaddy of fantasy role-playing games is currently enjoying a cultural renaissance. Thanks in part to its prominent depiction in Netflix's hit series Stranger Things, D&D has minted a new generation of dice-slinging fans, D&D-themed podcasts, Twitch shows, and D&D influencers on YouTube and TikTok. While few games have enjoyed the kind of multi-generational influences D&D, the corresponding business has often struggled over the years to live up to its potential, leaving in its wake not great fortunes, but instead a long legacy of infighting, litigation, and squandered opportunities. Tonight we begin with a story about make-believe adventure and real-life violence, and what some critics fear is a connection between the two in a game called Dungeons and Dragons. Throughout the 1980s, evangelical Christian groups frequently accused D&D with its spells of magic, ornate bestiaries, and horned deities as being a plaything of the devil, making it difficult for the game's owners to turn it into a family-friendly mainstream brand. Now Hasbro, the giant toy company that owns D&D, is hoping that the business side of the game can finally catch up with its cultural prowess. Over the next year, Hasbro will be unleashing some major D&D brand extensions, aiming to rake in more money from D&D's swelling fan base. The streaming service Paramount Plus is currently developing a live-action D&D series. In August, Baldur's Gate 3, the latest sequel in a popular series of video games based on D&D, is scheduled to go on sale. And sometime next year, Hasbro is expected to release one D&D, the next iteration of the classic game, this time with a whole new suite of digital enhancements. Most importantly, on March 31st, Hasbro's E1 Studio and Paramount will be releasing Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves, a big-budget, CGI-laden Hollywood spectacle. For the D&D movie to succeed, it not only has to produce big numbers this spring, but also spawn the kind of long-living entertainment franchise that Hasbro has enjoyed with Transformers. Since 2007, the six Transformer films based on its warrior car toys have generated close to $5 billion in theater ticket sales. Hasbro hopes that this time around, D&D fans will embrace the movie and everything else coming down the pipeline. If they do, after 50 years, D&D may finally live up to its business potential. All right, thanks to Bloomberg's Felix Gillette for that report. I know for you dungeon masters and halflings out there, it's a big Friday night. You've got to head to the movie theatre. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Catch us in an hour. I'm going to be doing a Twitter Spaces on all things AI. It has been an astonishing week for the world of artificial intelligence, and our very own Rachel Metz is going to be up with me. Lots to recap in the show, so check out the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and, of course, on all the Bloomberg platforms. It is the last day of March. It is the last day of the quarter. Technology absolutely jumping first three months of this year. So much more to go. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.